It's early morning and these children enjoy their last moments of play before class begins. Not long ago, this was a place of despair. People would wait in limbo, sometimes for years on end, for life-changing decisions. Do you know what this place used to be before it was a school? Um, it used to be a place for the refugees. Uh, they, they were brought here and they were a home for them. <laughs> This is Nauru, and this is what the school looked like seven years ago. Back then, it was the State House Processing Centre, the smaller of two Nauruan camps that made up part of John Howard's so-called Pacific Solution. Over seven years, more than 1,300 asylum seekers were processed on the island. And for most of that time, journalists, lawyers and refugee activists were not welcome here. It's images like this that have come to inform how many Australians see Nauru. It's now four years since the detention centres closed and just as the school's been made over, so too has the island. Via the coastal road, it takes just 20 minutes to circumnavigate. This is the smallest island nation on earth. Just 10,000 people live here, but with rapid population growth, Nauru is reaching capacity. Phosphate mining once made the country fabulously rich, but now it's coping with the aftermath of a crippling recession and political instabilities. When I visited the island, Marcus Stephen was president, but since then, corruption allegations have failed him and in just one week, he was replaced by two other presidents. These are testing times for Nauru, but still, it's a place where some can prosper. Rick Deo's come a long way since he lost his job with the International Organisation for Migration, or the IOM. He used to work here at Topside, the larger of the two detention centres. Most of the buildings here are now gone, removed, except for some of them. You can see it around that it's left. It is good to, to feel the experience, to feel the feeling once more here, meeting and um, experiencing different cultures of people, nationalities, and uh, I guess most of all is understanding human nature, human beings. Cross your fingers. When Mr. Deo was still working at the IOM, he recruited a handful of colleagues to work on the side as security officers. Now he employs a hundred people. Well, I started with my company with seven staffs. They were all members of the lifeguard team who were working with the program, with the IOM program. And now my company has now over, just over a hundred staffs. And um, part of what I've achieved is managing part of the hotel, which is called the Reef Bar. And um, yeah, I guess it's all part of hard work and determination. I'm okay. There was a time not too long ago when Nauru was the marvel of the Pacific. Through the mining of phosphate, a critical ingredient in chemical fertiliser, the country grew rich, very rich. Sports cars were a common sight on the island. And Air Nauru had a fleet of five planes. This was the second richest country per capita on earth and Nauruans were flying high. One particular gentleman uh, had diarrhea, and you want me to tell that one? <laughs> and he rushed to the public toilet, and uh, there was no toilet paper, so he opened up his wallet and used fifty dollar notes. <laughs> David Anjame is a minister at the Assembly of God. He's seen Nauru through all its extremes. 
every three months there was quite an excessive amount of royalties being paid out. And, and for example, one one story of one old gentleman was that you know every three months he would get you know a hundred thousand dollars, but he would, every time he would get this money, you know, you know a week later he he'd, he'd have none of it. And uh, one such uh, story involving him was that you know he he. Um, uh, invited all his friends after he had collected all his money in a plastic bag from the bank. Uh, I think at that time he must have received something like seventy or thousand dollars, and uh, gave this great big party, drinking party. When I say big party, you know, involving maybe a dozen people only, just sitting around having a drink. Finally, he gets drunk, and the rest of the money he um, uh, wraps up and puts under his head as a pillow. Wakes up in the morning and the money's gone. So. Uh, you know, easy come, easy go. But about a decade ago, the royalties stopped flowing. The island still bears the scars of what people here call the bad years. Between 1963 and the 1990s, Nauru received the full price for phosphate. It was more than two billion dollars and if it had been sensibly invested every Nauruan, man, woman and child would now be in possession of half a million dollars. They chose not to do it. times when it was very hard, um, Naruns were scouring the reef looking for any kind of uh, food they could find, shellfish, any kind of um, uh, fishing was uh, off the reef, just, just trying to survive. Ten years later, Nauru remains one of the poorest countries in the Pacific. Half of its income comes from foreign aid, and more than half of the population lives below the poverty line. With only a small welfare net, the responsibility falls on the church to help out. I know that with us, People do come and ask, you know, for um, extra money, you know, a bit of money just to help them get by. A lot of families do struggle. And you look at the place and you see run-down places and, and uh, you know, houses are not in very good condition. And that's all because they struggle. They can't keep up the maintenance of the work of the home. So let alone just trying to feed the family <laughs> John and Lisa Tiabouge have seven children, including a daughter left handicapped by a bout of meningitis. He earns just $70 a week. So it's quite not enough. But we have um, the Lord's blessing. He has blessed us a lot. Most weeks the family goes without vegetables and salt, but they've learned to be resourceful. There are some extra things he does, like going diving, selling the fish. Sometimes if not sell, we would just give it out to others. Nauruans are still paying heavily for the gambles and the errors of their former leaders. There are no banks left on the island and no credit card facilities either. But this is a nation that's learning to adapt and things are a lot healthier than they were in the bad years. A lot of the lines that, that we were stocking then were, were the bare essentials. Your flour, your sugar, milk, uh, 
biscuits, rice. If you look through these lines here with the, the, uh, the can, can products, um, we, you know, there's a, there's a big variety now. Um, we, we usually just stock one particular line of each. At least there was something uh, there for people if they, if they wanted. Um, people weren't hugely selective. Um, price was the most important thing, so you would stock the cheapest one possible. In a lot of cases, it was lines like the black and gold lines and, and things like that. If you, if you look now, there's not a lot of black and gold at all. People are able to afford, you know, something that's, you know, a bit better in, in, in quality. Riding a wave of optimism, Mr Oppenheimer has also just opened a new restaurant, the most expensive on the island. Coming to Nauru, there, is, there isn't a lot of sort of uh, variety available in, in terms of, of food in restaurants. Um, there's only Chinese, Chinese and, 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 and Chinese. So uh, something different uh, I found would be appreciated and welcomed by everybody. Other major improvements have been in infrastructure. During the bad years, the island's power station was left to decay and electricity was sporadic. But now, thanks to a revamp funded by AusAid, Nauru has a consistent and reliable supply of electricity. The island also has its first mobile phone network. The first thing that we noticed here was that Nauru was a, was a country that was um, piecing back together all, all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle to build back its economy. We have 6,000 active subscribers in Nauru out of a population of just under 10,000. Uh, which, is, which is probably as much as we're going to get with, you know, a large percentage of the population being so young. It's the flow of phosphate that's helped to revive Nauru. During the bad years, mining all but stopped. But today it accounts for about 40% of the country's GDP. There's an estimated $1.5 billion of phosphate left in the ground. We're mining around about 500 thousand tons uh, a year. Uh, that's going to increase probably up to about 700,000 tons in a couple of years time. And then uh, probably the life of the uh, phosphate at that rate is probably around about uh, 35, 35 years. But even with the mining, there are doubts over Nauru's sustainability. Aside from the sale of fishing licenses, the island has no other viable industry. There is no way that barren island can support 10,000 people. And what's more, there is no way that that barren island can give a satisfactory life to young people in Nauru. The real test for Nauru is to see men like Valiant Harris employed. He lost his job at the detention centres four years ago. Now he makes pizza to sell, but the income isn't enough to support his four children. I've applied for seven jobs and I haven't had any of them yet. Two of them shortlist and the others were like just no response at all. But Mr Harris is hopeful. His wife has a job and he's optimistic about the future. Things are picking up now, but really slowly. But I reckon we'll get there. That's why I'm still waiting. <laughs>